The time has come when we must take a stand. To all the poachers, to all the buyers, your days are numbered. Yes, that's a clip from a really extremely powerful documentary I just recently watched called When Lambs Become Lions. It's in select New York theaters today. Matter of fact, it's already nominated for two 2019 IDA Documentary Awards for Best Cinematography and Best Editing. Mm. Um, this is about the full understanding of po the poaching, Ill illegal poaching of elephants, illegal ivory trade from every perspective. A lot of times we don't, or none of the times, so you rarely get a chance to hear the uh, thoughts and see the lives of the actual people who are poaching these animals. Um, it's really interesting about um, elephants because I grew up just kind of loving animals, you know what I mean? And I remember growing up in Oakland, we used to go downtown and buy these little ivory elephants and not realizing that that ivory was probably from illegal, well, it was, it was from illegal ivory trade, but it was Everywhere we went, you see ivory. I don't know if it was good ivory, bad ivory. When you travel the world, you see these ivory objects, um, these ivory, uh, these ivory objects, statues, or whatever it may be. All of those things are from illegal ivory trade. Mm. If you see anybody selling ivory, it's illegal. Wow. The only way you could get real ivory is by killing an elephant. Mm. You can't reproduce elephants. You cannot harvest ivory without killing the animal. You can't cut the tusk in half and say, oh, we'll leave the other half, or maybe it'll grow back. It doesn't regenerate, correct? Yeah. Correct. Okay, so you have to kill a you have to kill an elephant to do it. Right now, from what I remember, a hundred a hundred elephants a day are being killed. A hundred elephants a day are being killed. For the ivory specifically? Some for food too. You know, mostly, mostly ivory, but mostly ivory, mm. uh, maybe 400,000 remaining. Um, this stuff is illegal. Um, our guest is the director of this documentary who actually followed poachers for three years inside the thought process, um, the methods of tracking. Uh, you actually get to see how they relate to their families, their family members. Uh, what the what the locals think about what it is that they're doing? They're outlaws. They're constantly being chased by uh, rangers. The government is against it. Everybody's against it, but yet these people are still poaching. So I want to welcome our guest, John Caspi, is here with us today, and uh, I want to thank you for the work you've done, man. This is such an enlightening documentary. What made you decide to do it? Well, I'd done three other projects in Kenya before this mm -hmm. one, and it was through those that I had a lot of friends in Kenya. And they were the ones early on that were reaching out to me saying, you know, there's so many films and journalists coming to Kenya and telling this story around poaching, but it's being told in this very good versus evil black and white narrative. And they were really encouraging me to come and, and see a different side of it, which was that there's a complexity to it that isn't being explored. Uh -huh. So they were really pushing me to look at it from the hunter's perspective because they feel like that was sort of the missing piece in the conversation. So... But it's interesting because there's so much conflicted thoughts in that area. You got the hunter, you got the locals. I saw a clip in the documentary where one of the hunters was approached by his babies, his child, his son. And his son said to him, Daddy, you're going to burn in hell for what it is that you do mm. by killing these animals, by poaching these animals, right? Yeah. You know, and this is, to me, that was so powerful. He chased his son around, was trying to whip his son, and then the son's mother came and was like, I can't do this anymore. Poachers are experiencing. I don't feel sorry for a poacher. I, I'll be honest with you. I, yeah, I, yeah. Um, what did you learn, though? Did you find any sympathy for the poachers? Oh yeah, I mean, I kind of came into this with pretty traditional preconceived notions around okay. the issue. You know, that when you kill an animal, it's bad, and when you're out there protecting it, it's good. And I saw these as two very separate sides. But after about the first year of living with these guys, it became clear that these aren't separate sides at all. This is actually one community that feels like it's stuck in an infrastructure that doesn't have options outside of these two sides. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these rangers, they used to poach before yeah. they became rangers. Uh -huh. And it's not uncommon for rangers to go back to poaching. And, and these are people that are family. These are friends. This is a community that's grown up together their whole lives. They all know each other. There's uh -huh. no secrets. And so it's a, it's a very kind of a Western perspective to look at this issue and think that these are separate sides and so that was the first big thing was, okay. was realizing that these these guys all know each other and they're actually working together a lot of the time yeah um so the, they're 
their desire to poach is because there's no economy in Kenya, in northern Kenya? They feel like there's a lack of opportunity. Okay, lack and, of. And also, these are skills, right? Uh-huh. Like, these are skills that have been passed down for generations. Like, like X and Lucas, the two main uh, poachers we follow, like, their fathers taught them how to do this, and their fathers' fathers taught them how to do it. Hmm. And the very process of making the poison, like, they'll spend two weeks creating a specific poison just for an elephant. And if they're going after an ostrich, like, they'll kill ostriches for their feathers for wedding ceremonies. It's a totally different poison. And then once they've created that poison, it's another, you know, weeks of tracking elephants, figuring out what type of elephant. If, like if it's a mother with children, they'll treat it differently than if it's a male that's on its own. What is the consequence when you're caught poaching? Death. Just like that. It used to be that uh, rangers have the right to kill, right? So if yep. they see someone near an elephant with weapons, they'll shoot you. And it used to be that if you got caught and you weren't killed, which was uncommon, you'd go f- to prison for life. And Kenya's recently changing their rules. And so now you actually get the death penalty from the government. Wow. So and there's no outcome outside the, of death at the moment. In the dock, how do they kill them? Because I, I, when we were talking about there, it, was there was when they walk into the river and they show, like, you know, some of them get strung up here and the alligators or the crocodiles will eat them. So that was also an option that was talked about in the film. So you get caught poaching, they tie you up to a pole, and it's kind of like an eye for an eye justice. You killing animals, so animals about to kill you. Wow. Correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also a way to get rid of the body. Yeah. You know? I mean, X X is... The first time I met X, I sat down with him, and I kind of went into it expecting him to be a little bit, you know, sketchy or secretive or kind of what you'd imagine when you think of someone doing an illegal trade. But he wasn't at all. He was really direct, and he was honest, and he was telling me exactly how he felt and Mm -hmm. what he did, and he didn't have shame around what he was doing. He was like, look, we're out here killing animals, but these rangers are killing humans. And my father was killed when I was 10 years old, shot eight times in the face. And it got swept under the rug and no one talks about it. And so he was like, there's this whole other side to the situation that no one's talking about. And mm-hmm. the world and the media looks at us as the bad guys, but they don't realize how complex it actually is. Wait, he was shot in the face that many times for poaching? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. His yeah. father did the same thing he did. Right. John Caspi is here. We're talking about when lambs become lions. Um, and it's in select New York theaters today. But when is it going to be released? Like, when can all folks be able to view this? That's a good question. I'm not sure yet. Okay, John. Yeah. That's why you can't. Yeah. Okay, John doesn't know that? Yeah. <laughs> so, is the. Um, ne- next year. Next year. Next year? Yeah. Yeah. Expanding 2020. You need some money? <laughs> this is a, okay, go ahead, Heather. I'm sorry. <laughs> John, so you spent time because I, I'm still not, I'm I'm just not clear on yeah. on the why. Like mm-hmm. you you spent time with them, and there's they you said they feel that there's no other source of income. Mm-hmm. So, um, how much are they get? How much are they getting? Like you you're yeah. gonna risk your life to do something so horrible to me. Um, how much do they actually get? So poachers, you know, one elephant is about w- worth around $2,000 for them, right? And you got to remember they're working with a team and they're also paying off rangers at each step. But if you look at the other side of it, these rangers are getting paid $100 a month for what they do. And they're expected to be out in the bush 28 days out of the month. And if, when you watch the film, you realize that they're not actually being paid regularly. Mm-hmm. Like their salaries get delayed often. And over the course of three years, it was not uncommon for a month, two months to go by where they didn't get paid. And it got backlog- backlogged. Hmm. So, but you risking your life because you said the penalty is death. So you risk your life to split two thousand dollars. They're risking their lives, but the rangers are risking their lives too. I mean, I was there for three and a half years, and each year I saw about two rangers die in just the one unit I was following. Hmm. So, it, it, like, death is happening on both sides of the of this. It's not just the poachers. I actually, honestly, I actually felt more unsafe with the rangers. Than I did with the poachers because these rangers are out there 28 days out of the month. They're getting calls at 3 a.m. to go and handle a situation where there's live, you know, guns being fired. Uh-huh. Half of them have guns that don't work. They're wearing sandals. They don't have a car. They're they're using their cell phones as flashlights. Like these guys are under resourced, uh-huh. and a lot is being expected of them. And on the other side, the poachers like they're making more money, right? Uh-huh. They're making more money, and I think they're actually doing less work, and they're more specific in when they do it. You know, they spend a lot of time planning this very unsafe activity, and then they go and they do it, but the rangers are living that. You know, they're out there the whole month, yeah. and they're away from their families. That was another big thing. You know, X was like, I'm, I don't want to become a ranger because that means I don't see my kids. You don't see your kids. Yeah. I, I, the other part, to have this point that I'm confused about is, uh, even in a documentary, you hear a public official, I don't know who it was, was it a uh, some leader in Kenya. It's a president. It was the president, president of Kenya. Kenya. Okay, yeah. my bad. Um, and he was talking about, you know, we want to eradicate this poaching. We're going to catch you. You know, your days are numbered. But it's everywhere. Like, how are they attacking the buyer? 
I mean, mm. people have ivory. You could go downtown New York right now. Mm. You're going to see ivory everywhere. Why is that allowed to happen when we know it, it happened illegally? Like, what is, what's It's been... shifting. It's shifting. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the ivory gets bought in China. Okay. Um, and a few years ago, China put out a ban on buying and selling ivory, which was a big deal. And that happened soon after the big ivory burn that you see in the okay. film. Yeah. Um, so those two events, okay. you know, are connected. And that actually had real ripple effects within Kenya. I mean, after that, Lucas, the main poacher we'd been following... Um, stopped. He turned his back on X and he said, I'm done. I don't want to be a part of this anymore. It really shook up the community. And then for X, like he had a very different reaction to that event. I mean, he saw it from a business perspective. He was like, oh, supply just went down significantly because the government just burned over 100 tons of ivory. So there's a lot less supply. And so our price can go up. So he was trying to sell. He was trying to sell. They burned $150 million worth of ivory. And they said to them, to the rest of the world, it's valuable to us. It's worthless unless it's on our elephants, on mm-hmm. our animals, but it is $150 million. A lot of those uh, rangers but, watched that, and they yeah. were like, we haven't been paid in two months, and you're going to burn all this money that could be put into conservation? And, like, yeah. that's, and they're, you know, they're out there risking their lives to collect these tusks. So who's responsible for paying the rangers? There's, it's either the government or it's NGOs. So there's two types of rangers. There's mm-hmm. One's funded by the government, and one's funded by NGOs. And neither is being paid. Yeah, I think so. Uh, we we followed one specific unit, um, mm-hmm. but what we saw is not unique, right? Like this this process of of corruption from the top coming down and people on the on the bottom of the chain not being paid is something we heard about in a lot of different situations. Mm. So a poaching uh, could be easily said as a um, byproduct of a failed economy, correct? And um, it does affect the ecosystem because I'm sure elephants provide some purpose in the ecosystem, of whether course. it's eating plants or whatever it is, you know, uh, fertilizing the land for yeah. plants, for animals, all, so on and so forth. How legislatively, uh, how can, you know, politics help this process or help mm-hmm. eradicate poaching? Uh, I mean, I think that I think that in the media we really try to simplify these stories. Yeah. I think that's kind of how we got to this place where okay. the solution right now in Kenya is to kill people. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I think a big part of my motivation for making this film was to show that it's not that simple. And that when you actually get into it and you look at it from the locals' perspectives, the guys that are actually living this out, it's extremely complex and there's a lot of pieces to it that get lost in the stories that we tell. Um, and so I personally, I believe the solutions are going to come from within. I think there's a lot of people that are outside of Kenya that are not Kenyan coming in trying to solve this issue. And when you look at what happens, it creates a lot of other issues. Sometimes it's good, but in a lot of cases, there's a lot of disconnect and there's a lot of cultural things that, that you know, don't translate through. And so I think the solutions are going to come from within. And there's a lot of people within Kenya that are finding creative solutions to this, which is exciting. Yeah. John Caspi is here. John, what's the average lifespan of an elephant? I want to say it's around 40 years. So years? it's no interest in waiting until the elephant dies to get the ivory. They do that sometimes. Yeah. No, the, the guys I was with would do that. And they would also go after older elephants that were in like the last two or three years of their life, for sure. That was something they were very, you know. Okay. They're, they're conscious. Like these aren't guys that are evil. These aren't guys that are out there trying to like create, you know. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. I, I, I did not. I kind of went into it not being sure. And I was trying to just be as open as I could and really as a sponge to absorb everything. And I mean, I came away realizing that these are guys trying to survive. These are guys trying to feed their families. These are guys, these are guys waking up every morning thinking about how am I going to feed my kids. They would cry when they would kill animals, yeah, right? Yeah, I'm yeah, wondering yeah. this. Like, were they religious at all? Would they pray over the animals? Like, you saw a psychological effect because over in the States, if you kill an, uh, an animal, then you're looked at as a psycho. There's a, there's this, there's a, I have this idea that when you kill an elephant, you, a curse comes onto you and, it, and you pass it on to your children. That's something they believe in and they feel that. You know, they feel that they don't they don't feel good about what they're doing. You, you guys actually interviewed some kids and, and I believe one of the young uh, mm. girls has said that our land is cursed. Where are our animals? Our land is cursed. And so the kids are like not for the poaching. Right. right? right. Uh, man, this is really interesting. John G- Caspi is here. Uh, <laughs> this is powerful director of a uh, film when lambs become lions. You know, you're you're pretty you know, lean, you know, good looking guy. And you were in the bush, you know, were you ever in danger? I mean, was, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, you know, you look uh, like an easy target basically is what I'm saying. Yeah, you know. I am. I mean, okay. I think my height, I'm tall. Uh-huh. You know, I think that actually makes me stand out a lot, but a, a huge part of it, you know, like I was requiring a lot of trust from these guys okay. to, for this film to be made. You know, they're putting everything out there and they're letting us show it and share it with the world. Cause they believe there's meaning in it. And part of that process and getting their trust was showing them that like, I'm going to put in the work to stay up and, and to keep up with you mentally, physically, emotionally, and go and be a part of all these things. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, like, 
um, I went on 10 hunts total in the first three. They asked me not to bring a camera. And that was by hard the hardest part of this project because when you have a camera, you're separating yourself from reality. Yeah. And you have this, this heightened sense of purpose in what you're doing. Uh -huh. Once that's stripped away, you're just a part of what's going on. Um, and so I think kind of taking those risks and showing them that like, you know, I'm going to sleep on your floors. I'm going to like eat with you. I'm going to like the way you live is the way I'm going to live. And we're equals in this situation. Like there's no separation. What was the food like? Right. Oh, man. <laughs> what did you, what were you uh, eating? A lot of Ugali, which is... um. The bird? No, no, no. no, Ugali, no. Like think about like mashed potatoes and okay. grits mixed and then like left out until it like got a little bit hard, like hardened okay. and had like no taste. That's like the most common. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Did you eat any meat from the bush? On like special occasions, uh -huh. like like at a wedding, there would be camel. So you'd eat camel. And then like if, if someone had like made some money somehow, there'd be goat. Yeah. Um, but it was pretty rare. Yeah. How did that camel taste? I didn't actually. My camel was all right. It wasn't yeah, bad. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't bad. taste like chicken. Honestly, they're they're, <laughs> my, <laughs> they're bigger on drinking like camel's milk, like right from the camel, and that's mm. it was like very warm, and that made me feel pretty sick. You didn't eat elephant. No, no. There's a few tribes that eat elephant, but the guys I was mm. following didn't. It's, it's kind of uncommon. Yeah. We've had a couple other um, documentary filmmakers, um, like Alex Winter, for example, mm -hmm. who, you know, you guys have to go into these environments where you have to gain someone's trust before they even allow you to see what goes on behind the scenes, whether it's in the jungle or like, you know, some cyber tech stuff like that. So how long does it take for you just initially to make contact and then be like, hey, I'm literally just here to document what's going on. I'm not here to like snitch on you or like, you know, get you in trouble and things like that. On this film, it was about seven months of, of living with these guys. Um, and it was, it, it wasn't just like for, to get their trust. It was also important for me to like understand at all what was going on. You know, like I went into this, I didn't like prepare for this, trying to s understand the situation holistically. I wasn't trying to see all parts of it. I was like, I want to follow three perspectives that are on the ground and hear voices that we don't get to hear mm -hmm. often. And so part of that was like, I have a lot of work to do. And it wasn't, this film for me wasn't about information. It wasn't about context. I wanted to put audiences in their shoes. I wanted people to feel what they were going through. And part of that involved me actually feeling that myself so I understood what, you know, what we were talking about. Um, you got the Sudan, you have um, Tanzania, all of these are bordering countries, right? Um, the same problem is happening there too? Yeah. Okay. I mean, each country is a little different uh -huh. in how they deal with it, but yeah. Okay, now the irony is, I want to say in Thai places like Thailand, they revere the elephant. Mm. You know, and right. yeah, it's an icon. Mm -hmm. You know, they they worship the elephant. Different places around the world where they actually worship the elephant, it's illegal to touch them. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yo, this shit is crazy. It's, cool. it's crazy. It's like black people. What do you mean? Well, in some countries, black people are known as like the golden people, uh -huh. and then in other places, we're so easily disposed. Oh, okay. Okay, that's that was deep. Oh, don't touch that, John. Don't get out of there. Back God, away. Yeah. Back away from that, John. <laughs> <laughs> he was in his head. He was like, Shh. <laughs> but, 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 but what I am thinking too uh, is, I even hate this kind of idea. I'm just thinking off the top. Is it a way that the country? Nah, it's just never right. It's just. Uh, it. you, uh, you, uh, uh, you know, like, well, let's say with weed here in the United States, yeah. it mm -hmm. was illegal for so long, and now the government understand mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. you know, marijuana can actually be a benefit if used correctly, mm -hmm. and now they're mm -hmm. trying to regulate everything. That's how, that, that yeah. idea is yeah. happening in other countries in Africa, where, okay. where but it, what, it's, it's super complicated, because yeah. locals aren't paying thousands of dollars to go and kill these animals. It's, yeah. it's Westerners that are doing that. Yeah. And then you're setting this crazy precedence where it's like, it's illegal if local people do it to their own heritage, you know, their own mm -hmm. animals. We're going to let white people come in and mm -hmm. pay thousands of dollars to do it and then put that money back towards conservation. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people look at that and say, that's a business model. That's a way to actually keep these animals alive. But I, I don't know. I don't know that it's, that's it's, right. It's, yeah. I don't know it, that it, that's right. Like, you're still it, killing animals. You're still killing animals. And it's like, do we need to, like, do we have to be killing these things to keep them alive? I mean, you look at the history of, of any time humans come in and try to save something that's going extinct, we almost yeah. always mess it up. Yeah, yeah. We, we almost always mess it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. John Caspi is here when lambs become lions. Anybody has any questions, 888-742-3345. I'm assuming you're not on social media. I'm not, but the film has social media. <laughs> the film is what not. Look for me. Yeah, why, why do you? <laughs> <laughs> this dude don't give a damn about. He's in. He's he's in the bush. You know, he's doing real work. The yeah. film has social media, media okay. at when lambs. Okay, at yeah. when lambs. Guys Instagram. like this don't have social media. <laughs> You're not in a relationship? No. Yeah, yeah, you know, come on, man. These dudes can't. How can he be? He spent three years in, like. Yeah. Well, here, I will say, I was in a relationship when I made this film. 
So okay, yeah, yeah. I had a, a really strong partner. Today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, hey, Poacher, take a selfie. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I won't go into your relationship oh, if it's thanks, about it's thanks, okay, no yeah. problem, brother. Uh John, you got a question for John? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's up? what's up, what's up, family? Uh you 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 hit on everything that you said correctly. I I personally am from Africa and I got a uh cousin who's actually a, a, a ranger and he just hit me up last week begging me for money and I'm ducking him, you know? <laughs> so I can relate. It starts from the government. They're crooked, they don't pay nobody. And especially the pay that they give you, it can't even feed a damn mouse for the whole month. And they, they hold your pay for three months, four months. How you hold, you pay somebody $50 a month and you're holding four months of salary? So it starts from the top. And it's the Westerners that come in and pay this big amount of money. How can you not take that? Yeah. It starts from the government. You know, they all corrupt from the top. Yeah. And how's the, the people on the bottom not supposed to take that shit? So it, it starts from the government, start and that's the... where it needs to be. And the president's sitting there giving that uh, 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 bullshit-ass speech. <laughs> yeah. It's him, crook. Yeah, <laughs> because it's, crook. It's, a, it's, it's exported out. Like, how is it even getting out of the country? Right. You know what I mean? Without the government being involved. It, get, it gets I mean, to a point where you really, when you really look at it, it's like, we're setting these rangers up to fail. You know, uh -huh. we're, we're setting them up to be in situations where it's like how like I got to a point where I was watching. I don't want to give away too much in the movie, but like the Rangers tempted. Right. He's tempted and he has this choice to make. He's like, do I stay true to my job and to my unit or do I give information to these poachers and then have money to feed my newborn? Uh -huh. And it gets to a point where it's like, is he supposed to pick his job over, over his, his, his family? family? Yeah, and so. I got to a situation for myself. Where I was like, I don't know what I would do if I was in his shoes. Uh -huh. And that became the core. That became the core. It's like, how do we kind of craft this film in a way that puts audiences and puts people that are watching this in that dilemma? Because uh -huh. that's a very real dilemma. I think a lot of people are facing in Kenya right now. Absolutely. We have actually John. You're a citizen. Swain, the morning. Thank you, Jamel. Did you grow up in Kenya? No, I didn't grow up in Kenya. Um, I'm, I'm actually I'm from Nebraska, but I represent an artist who's over in Kenya. So I'll be in Kenya. In, in uh, February, actually. So, okay, what are your yeah, thoughts? So, what are your thoughts on this? Well, it's actually it's pretty interesting. I look, I look, you know, to, to learn a little bit more about it because, um, like, I have an Afrobeat artist who's doing a lot over there by the name of by the name of Victoria Kamani. Uh, so, I mean, just just being connected to that part of Africa and being exposed to that dynamic is is always you know it's interesting. It's, you know, we as Black Americans we're exposed and taught one thing over here, but it's a whole other dynamic. To be there and be exposed to another another you know type of culture over there. Uh huh. So, and then uh, uh, and if, okay, thank you, Jamel. Thank you, man, for uh, promoting your artist. That was dope. Uh, <laughs> John, it happens, man. Uh, Seal is in Yo. Indianapolis. Go ahead, Seal. Talk to us. Hey, yeah, this is Seal, man, out of Indiana, man. I just wanted to say I'm on the, I'm on the road driving right now, but. Yeah, that situation, man, that's going on with the poaching, man. Yeah, that's that's crazy, man, and I hope that clears up. But I just wanted to say, man, what up, Sway? Yeah, hey, what up, man? man? Y'all my favorite station. And I just wanted to say, man, you need to have a segment on what old girl just said, something about how other um, other places treat us like we the golden people, man. I want to hear I want to hear a little bit more about that one day. Okay, we'll do that. The golden, the golden, what we call it, the golden, the gold. Well, she said other places yeah. throw us away as black people, you know. Okay, and we'll other, figure it out. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Like we're the golden people. We'll, 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 we'll do that next week. I got you, love. Okay. That was Tracy G. Man, touch, right. touch back on that, man, because uh -huh. that, that's what I'm into hearing about that type of stuff. But okay. yeah, man, okay, y'all so. my favorite. I'm on this road, headed to Texas, getting this money. So, you know. Get your money, so You're a citizen, man. Yeah. Sway in the morning. <laughs> You gotta find that golden place right. first. Go yeah. listen to our interview with Michael Eric Dyson, by the way, on YouTube. You'd probably enjoy that. AJ, um, have you been to Africa? Yes, I have. Um, I was in Africa about two weeks, well, not two years ago. Went on a safari, and um, we came upon the remnant of a bunch of rhinos who had their horns cut off by poachers. That happened that very same day. So. Um, when you witness something like that, seeing the killing of an animal uh, as big as that, it does something to you. I mean, yeah. granted, I, I, we don't live in Africa in that condition, but it, it, it's this double-edged sword, like you were saying, do I, do I do this legal thing by killing this, this 
magnificent creature to feed my family or do I protect and have my family's daughter? So it, it's a very, very, very interesting dilemma yeah. to go through. I don't know if it can be solved. Yeah, it's difficult. Uh, but thank you for your um perspective aj and that's the other thing i was i went on a safari i was in africa a couple months back and and a lot of the animals that are in the safari aren't wild and you know not they didn't grow up as wild animals so it's a a, 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 a lion that grew up in a safari that was raised in a safari is different from a lion that was raised in um uh, in the wild um but you being in the bush witnessed the murder of these animals it's traumatic. How, it's how, trauma. Yeah, like, how it's did, trauma. How did you cope? Have you seen a therapist? Like, right. how did you deal with that? Yeah, it's funny. Like, I'm working on three new films now, and my uh, therapist mm. every time is like, you need to stop doing yeah. these projects. He's yeah. like, not. He's very not into it. Um, <laughs> but uh, understands, like, the, the reason and the meaning behind it. Um, mm. No, I mean, the, the hardest, like I was saying earlier with the camera and the separation that creates, the hardest by far were the first three. Yeah. Because you're fully a part of it, and and you have this like gut reaction of like this shouldn't be happening. I should interfere. I should stop. And then you kind of are in this situation where it's like, why am I here? What is my purpose? And is it my job to interfere? Is it my job to try to change these people, or is it my job just to kind of save these moments and let other people see it so that we're actually affecting the way people think mm -hmm. and challenging preconceived notions? So those first three were the were the worst. But I will also say, and this is like a, a like a hard thing to admit, by the end. Those last couple hunts, we were going into it, and I like understood why they were doing it. That's not to say that I was like in support of it or yeah. that I like wanted them to be doing it, but like mm -hmm. I understood the consequences of what would happen if they didn't come out successful. Elef elephants are a very emotionally advanced animal. Yes, you know they they are emotional towards each other. If you see one get killed, if a, you know they. They mourn. They, they, come say, they come back. They come back to back. the site and they actually like, yeah. yeah. They hang around the corpse. They mourn. They Aww. check it out. Like they're emotionally advanced creatures. I was just watching a clip where a little baby animal got stuck in a water duct and a, they worked for hours to get that little baby elephant out of that water duct. Um, they're super smart. They're yeah. super smart and they're not just dying. You know, they don't just die instantly. You're hearing them cry out, I'm sure. I mean, You're so hearing they, them whine. The right? way that they're killing them, they're using these bows and arrows that have poison on them. They hit them, and then they wait 8 to 12 hours for yeah. that poison to spread. And that's a, that's a tracking process that's actually really dangerous. Because if that elephant smells, so they, 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 they think about everything. Like the weather's a huge part of it, where water is when it rained last, the direction that the, the herd is moving in, but also the direction of the wind. Mm -hmm. If the wind is behind you and you're approaching an elephant, you're done. It's going to smell you and kill you. It will attack you and kill you. So you have to make sure that you are always, so it's elephant, you, and the wind coming from the elephant's direction at wow. all times. So if the wind shifts and you're too close... The elephant's going to attack you, and you're done. I mean, it, they're they're when when is they that when feel, he picked up the dust when he was walking? And yeah, whenever he, they're picking up dust and sand, they're checking the direction of the wind. Gotcha. Yeah. Making sure you're downwind and not exactly. so we can. Yep. Oh. All right. Yeah. All right, John. Thank you, man. I I